provide the data online, along with, me, uh, me, along with museum documentation, imagery, species distribution, maps, and models. Here's a map showing the distribution of relative contributions of uh, some of our North American data donors. Um, the biggest circle here is us, the text map history collection. Uh, a and is a big contributor as well, Tulane. Um, some of these collections are really small collections, and you know, no bigger than classical specimens, and other bites are basically hidden from uh, researchers. So here's our, our data, uh, 123,000 records uh, from 1852 to 2010, 7,500 localities. Um, notice there is a lot of white space in here scattered about. Um, so we do need to do some more collecting, we believe, but a lot of this area is actually just places with no water, especially in West Texas. <coughs> so we're uh, building a digital library. A lot of the images are coming from our data donors. A lot of them are coming uh, to us. Uh, we have field photos which show habitat and collectors in the field, uh, which they show specimens before they actually uh, get in the jar. Field notes. Illustrations by Joe Camilleri that are anatomically accurate. Um, X-rays, uh, NC2 uh, photographs by Daryl Sigas. Uh, images of specimen details, such as this Donopodia and the lamprey mouth uh, here. We're, we're about to start scanning museum ledgers, and I'm going to talk today about our imaging of jar contents. Real quick uh, about our data improvement process. So after we geo-reference localities, we synonymize taxonomy and collector names. And um, then we can reconstruct collecting events to some extent and try to look for obvious errors in uh, date, location, or collector. And then we can plot out species by species and look for outliers. And we can research those records and look at the specimen, usually the trend of these specimen misidentifications. Here's the stepwise creation of current maps for three species spotted bass, Guadalupe bass, and Mississippi silver minnow. Um, you can see the first column here is basically the coordinates that we receiving from our donors. And um, at least at the time we received this data, most of them were not georeferenced. So you see very few points there. The second column shows uh, after we georeference, after we synonymize taxonomy, um, you get a lot more points, but there's still quite a few outliers. So then we've gone through and had a verification step where we look at specimens and labels and, and ledgers as much as possible. And uh, we've made the distributions look much more like you would expect them to look. And then we've gone and made the species distribution models, which take those point occurrences and convert them to uh, uh, continuous probability coverages. So data correction IDs are a major focus of the Fish of Texas, but we're working on these jar conference images. Um, these contain field labels, curation labels, determiner notes, as well as the specimens. And this target was not originally part of our Fish of Texas project. We didn't have funding to do it. Um, it's kind of been a secondary priority. But we recognize the obvious value when you open a jar, you know, take a photograph of specimen within the jar. And these support our IDs, as well as uh, report that occurs data. But due to time constraints, um, and in fact, the reason it's really simple, single setup, um, we have issues of, of glare, this is glare there, depth of field, a little bit of blurriness, and, um, Compositions are sometimes a little bit hasty. Every image has a color bar and a measuring stick. Um, fish to text ID label, which tells you our determination for species, uh, who determined it, the date, and uh, the institution in Catalonia. So, how do we deal with some of those issues? <coughs> Basically, just by taking lots of detailed images, we'll zoom in on the head or for a small specimen, we'll zoom in on just a specimen. Uh, same for a label, zoom in on just the label. We're finding a lot of variability in specimens and labels, and they're making our tasks a little difficult. Some specimens are very small, some are very large. Uh, we have a lot of curling of specimens, and uh, labels are variable as metal labels. Labels are glued to the specimen in some cases. Labels are wrapped around vials. Uh, they're on the box lid, for example. And we more or less have two digitization protocols. Uh, when we're traveling, we have to bring two to three stacks for our very capable IDs, and we do the ID as quickly as possible. There's a, basically a strong focus on IDs, and the photos are kind of uh, quick snapshots of uh, that are, are hopefully not going to get in the way of us getting as many IDs but as possible. Um, at home, we depend on volunteers, uh, which is uh, you know they're constantly in flux, so it's a big problem for us. 
Uh, but there, the processing time is more on the order of months. Um, we have a focus on IDs again, but um, we take more specimen observations and um, uh, photos as well. We have an internal working document uh, for when we're working with TNHC specimens. Uh, basically, it goes into things like workflow, um, how to use our, our data sheet, how to do data entry, uh, how to set up our camera, um, photo setup, as well as how to post process images, how to compose an image. Here's our little setup, it's very basic. Um, this is a collapsible uh, uh, light diffuser box. Um, we have the camera on a shutter release, two lights and one light on the side. Um, this whole thing is collapsible, it can fit inside this pelican case so we can travel with it. Here's our physical data entry form. And we have one of these sheets for every jar that we work on, and it gets a fixed size of the So on this side, you have specimen ID related data, um, the, 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 the determination and the date. Um, and then we report here um, other specimen information that's pretty easily acquired. Basically, when we have this jar open, what, can we get? <clears throat> what information can we get really easily? It's not going to take much time. So we take uh, links, min and max links, uh, uh, information about specimen quality, mutations, uh, sexes, uh, and parasites. And then we have kind of quality control and tracking section here. I circled the dates on here just to illustrate the fact that this specimen took us half a year or more, more than half a year to get through. It's been a lot of time on our processing shelf, basically. And then I circled the initials here, basically, to illustrate that it can take up three, three people to process the specimen, and in this case, in this case there's two. Here's a picture of the uh, jars on the shelves with uh, rubber bands. We have problems with rubber bands breaking. So why use the physical data entry form? Initially, I was very against using the physical data entry form, thinking, you know, it's going to reduce this transcription error if you did enter data directly into the database, enter at one time, and also the same time. But that was not at all the case for us. And I think it's in large part because we were using some volunteers who were very unreliable. And uh, we moved to this data entry form, and we got much more reliable data entry uh, just by hand on paper from them. And uh, this form follows our from shelf to shelf, uh, includes the status of the specimen, and acts as kind of a checklist. It allows us to keep our wet and dry workstations separate, uh, have a single trustworthy person doing the data entry, and also works with a physical paper backup. Here's our workroom. Uh, this back wall here, which you can't see, is, is full of shelves. And that wall, there's our photo station, and we have the central work table, and then there's data entry stations here. So our workflow basically is a uh, <coughs> pull bar, pull jars based on whatever fish of the Texas priorities we're working on. They're almost always ID priorities. We look at one species or uh, some species from an area. Um, and then we put them on shelf one. Then we uh, examine those specimens and fill out our data forms and, and, and fix them to the jar of the If they're correctly identified, they go to shelf two. If they're redetermined, they go to shelf 2.5 where they can then go to the collection manager and get assigned a new catalog number and label, and then back to shelf to continue on the process. Uh, we found we have to identify our specimens first because we're finding huge error rates in identification. So if we start digitizing before we do the IDs, we would end up having a lot of photos with more than one species of them. So then we photograph the jar, the specimens, often multiple times, check the photos, return the contents to the jar, and then they go to shelf three. And then there's a quality control step uh, where we can you know, use our trusted staff um, and they do the data entry into the cell and possibly the contents of the jar again. Um, they, they pick up the image we're going to keep or delete and uh, retake if necessary. Uh, and then there's a file renaming step here. The file name is basically uh, institution catalog number, uh, which can be extracted by opening the photo and just looking at it in the photo because it's in the photo every time. So just the institution catalog number would be all the jar contents. If it had a suffix after that, it would be some specimen detail. If some numerical suffix after that, it would be a specimen detail. And then if it had an L, it would be a label, and then there's sequentially you have multiple label details as well. File types are JPEG, and I feel like people are going to say we should use TIFF, and uh, we probably should. Um, resolution is 3072 by 2048, and they're initially stored on our University of Texas server, 
And then, um, then they go, if you go, when they go into our specified database, they go on our um, uh, Texas Advanced Competing Service and Service Reports. So um, we insert the fish and the pest labels in the jar, uh, put colored interfere dots in the lid, and we file away our data sheet, and it will return the specimens to the collection. Here's a jar ready to go back into the collection. It has a label basically stating that the contents have a photograph of the fish and the Texas project. And then, and, and by who, and the date. And then we have a uh, official test project label, which does uh, the determination, who determined it, when it was determined, and the institution catalog. All the jars in the collection, or almost all the jars in the collection, have this blue dot, which means uh, it has this inevitable. And then uh, for official test project, we need to these other dots. Um, the data has been entered, the specimen has been ID, and the specimen has been photographed. Here's where the um, information, the image, Ends up. This is one of our species. This is these are screen captures from one of our specimen pages from our website. And um, you can see on the, here, this is um, basically the verbatim donor after we received it from the donor, unchanged. And then we have all of our ends to that data in our notes discussing those edits. Uh, and then we have the map so we display where it is and uh, other geographic information here. And then we have the image. And our users are able to upload images. So all these, we're hoping to enlist a lot of citizen science and get images from all kinds of people, especially collectors who collected those specimens and they have images of them when they collected them. So our website, uh, www.officialtexas.org, but we're about to release, maybe next week even, a much better version, but right now we have test.officialtexas.org, and um, you need to use a username and a password to get in there, so you can go there if you wish. Um, uh, username will be test guest, password will be check your eyes, two eyes. Uh, and we encourage people to participate and upload images and um, comment.